Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We'll just wait a couple more minutes, like two, three more minutes, and then we can begin. So just giving uh, like uh, people to join, like a chance for them to join. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Can you, like while we wait for a couple more minutes, can you please introduce yourself in the chat? Like let us know where you're from, what school you're from, uh, are you a student or are you a career counselor or are you a teacher? Just let us know in the chat. Hi, Sharveen, welcome. Thank you for joining. Hello, Sadia, great that you could join us today. Hello, welcome, Akif. Thank you for joining. We'll just begin at 2.05. Hello, Zakia, welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Kirsten Maroney, Events and Awards Coordinator for Cambridge International. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar, Undergraduate Admissions in Australia, Guidance for Cambridge Learners. Um, before we get started, I'd like to briefly cover some housekeeping. During today's webinar, it will not be possible to have either your cameras or microphones switched on. 
However, you will be able to post your comments in the chat box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. You will also find a Q&A function in the toolbar. Please use this to post your questions. If someone has already asked a question that you would also like to ask, please like that question. Do also keep in mind that the time for questions will be limited. So please keep your questions concise and relevant to today's webinar. This will give us greater opportunity to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, thank you. I'll now hand over to Sanya, uh, Senior Recognitions Manager, Pakistan, to open today's session and introduce our panellists. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you, everybody. Hello, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking out the time and joining us in another webinar of the monthly webinar series that we do. And this webinar series is titled Cambridge in Pakistan Conversations to Support a Cambridge Learner's Journey. Uh, I'm Sanya Saif, Senior Recognition Manager for Pakistan at Cambridge Assessment International, and I'd like to welcome you all formally to this webinar and I hope you'll find it informative and useful. So we kicked off this webinar series in December um, 2021, so, and we bring new topics that are interest to you and your students, parents, especially uh, uh, student counsellors. Every month we bring those new topics to you, and if you've not been able to attend these previous webinars, the recordings are available on our website, so you can go on our web page and you can uh, watch the recordings over there. So we have very informative topics that we've covered in these past three months. So Cambridge, uh, what exactly is Cambridge? So th those of you who are not aware, Cambridge is uh, part of the University of Cambridge and it prepares school students for life, helping them develop an informed curiosity and a lasting passion for learning. So our international qualifications are recognized by the world's best universities and employers, giving students a wide range of options in their education and career. So as, for, as a not-for-profit organization, we devote our resources to delivering high quality educational programs that can unlock a learner's potential. So this monthly series has been designed to provide the most up-to-date and relevant information on how studying Cambridge qualifications can lead to university admissions, not only in Pakistan, but also abroad. So each month we have with us speakers who share the most recent information on everything related to a student's progress from Cambridge school qualifications, meaning IGCSE O-levels, A-levels to universities. So this includes information on uh, topics like eligibility criteria, entry requirements, acceptance, and recognition of Cambridge qualifications around the world, how our students perform at universities, and such relevant other topics. So the topic of these webinars are carefully selected. They reflect all such areas, and we actually encourage you to suggest topics for these webinars. So in the coming months, we would really be happy to hear from you if you'd like if you have any suggestions, you know, on the topics that we should cover in these webinars. So please feel free to add those suggestions in the comments, or we'll be sharing a feedback form towards the end of this webinar. Webinar. So please feel free to uh, leave your feedback regarding this webinar and also any suggestions that you have for what topics we should like cover in the coming ones, please leave those in uh, the feedback form as well. And I'll review them thoroughly and we'll make sure that we um, come back with you in coming months with webinars that cover those topics. So what exa who exactly is this webinar series uh, for? So this webinar space is basically for everybody, all those students, parents, teachers, school leadership, and, but most importantly, student counselors who actually spend their nights and days guiding and helping students secure university admissions. And I saw in the chat when you were introducing yourself that uh, like many student counselors amongst us today in the audience. So I'm really um, glad that you could join us and I hope you find this in, uh, webinar informative and useful uh, so, and you're able to guide your students better after this webinar. So this series is basically uh, here to provide you with all the information that you might otherwise find scattered in various different places. And it's difficult to get those information. We try and uh, collate that information and bring to you in one place. So our topic for today is undergraduate admissions in Australia, guidance for Cambridge learners. I'll introduce the speakers that we have with us today. We have Kamal Mahmoud, recognition manager for Asia Pacific and Cambridge Assessment International. We have with us Nishan Jadav, senior regional manager, South Asia, Middle East and Africa of University of Sydney, and Sunila Lakvi, country manager, Pakistan Monash University. So without any further delays, I'll dive straight into the topic. I'd like to welcome Kamal. Kamal uh, is basically uh, a part of Cambridge assessment team. Uh, Kamal is my colleague and he joined uh, Cambridge in August 2015 as Senior Recognitions Manager for Southeast Asia and Pacific. He's based in Singapore office and his key responsibilities include building Cambridge assessment and universities relations, as well as enhancing recognition of Cambridge qualifications within the higher education sector in the region. So hello, Kamal, welcome. Thanks, thanks, Sanya. Uh, allow me to start by saying hello to everyone. Just to clarify, uh, I don't cover the entire Asia Pacific. I only cover Southeast Asia, the 10 ASEAN countries, as well as Australia, New Zealand primarily. And that's the reason why I'm with you today to, uh, to talk about Destination Australia. May I have the next slide, please? 
Right. Uh, many of you will be very familiar about the fact that Australia is a key uh, higher education destination for Cambridge learners. And I'm pleased to inform you that in the case of Australia, all the universities uh, are you know, able to recognize the qualification that you submit to them. And this would include the group of eight universities. And within this group of eight universities, I'm happy that both Monash as well as Sydney universities are joining us today for the presentations proper, right? So do be assured that as long as you are going to Australia, no universities within Australia would be unfamiliar when it comes to Cambridge qualifications. Next, please. Now, as always, you start with the recognition search. You go to the drop down list and you look for Australia, and you will see all the recognition statements that Australian universities have provided. So it's quite straightforward there. Next, please. Now, generally, I just want to. Uh, talk briefly about the Australian University admissions. As I've mentioned, all Australian universities recognize Cambridge qualifications. Now, in general, three A-levels are required for admissions into Australian universities, but there are scenarios, there are cases where universities do accept a combination of A-levels and AS levels. So do check with them uh, separately as well. But what I know, what we know in the New South Wales, uh, generally they only accept A-levels for admission into uh, the universities in New South Wales. Uh, international students generally apply directly to the university of their choice. So they don't have like a common app or, or a UK system in Australia where you can use, you just directly apply to the universities and you therefore need to check with them uh, the requirements, right? Now, some universities will make international students offer based on predicted A-level grades or evidence of ability from AS level. So especially for those who intend to join the August semester, right? Uh, do take the opportunity to ask questions later on, you know, to Sunila as well as Nishan on the possibility of joining uh, the Australian universities in August, uh, bearing in mind that you have your uh, certificates, uh, uh, or rather your results released in August itself. So uh, that's pretty much my advice for now. I'm happy to answer Q&A later. And next, please. Uh, again, as I said, with regard to Australian universities, they are less restrictive in terms of subjects requirement. Uh, as compared to say in Europe, where you need to fulfill certain combination, Australian universities are very, very accommodating of uh, A-levels generally. And they are very familiar as well as our subject combinations. So uh, obviously with some subjects, there are requirements. Uh, for, for example, those who want to study law or medicine, you need to fulfill certain requirements. But again, as I said, do check with their uh, universities uh, directly for this. And with that, next please. Uh, thank you. That's my presentation, Sanya, and I'm happy to answer questions later on during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamal. So if you have any questions related to um, Southeast Asia or the Pacific, um, please uh, feel free to email Kamal. His email is on the screen. Please, uh, for more questions, you can also uh, write in the question and answer function of Zoom. Uh, please only use the Q&A functions because sometimes in the chat, the questions tend to get lost. So we'll be keeping track of the questions in the Q&A function. So please feel free to leave your questions over there. So moving forward, I'd like now to introduce uh, Nishant, our next speaker for today. Nishant is a senior regional manager for South Asia, Middle East and Africa at University of Sydney. He joined University of Sydney in 2007 as a business school student to pursue Master of Business. After finishing the course, he continued to work there and now looks after the student recruitment and admissions group to lead the development, coordination and implementation of the university's student recruitment plan. Nishant has broad understanding of the education system, culture and expectations of prospective students from the subcontinent region. So welcome, Ashad, and over to you. Thanks, Lord Sanya. Good afternoon, everyone. Like, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, sharing the experience of studying in Australia, which I had a privilege of studying 10 years back, and I've been able to share my experience with a lot of students. Today, we are going to share some insights about studying in Australia, and more importantly, admission process for your undergraduate studies in Australia. 
one thing I always uh, talk to students, there are no set rules for choosing a country, course, or a university. Ultimately, it will come down to what's most important to you as a student. Each student has a different reason for studying overseas with motivations ranging from improving language skills, career prospects, to experiencing life and culture in a new country. But one thing is for sure, studying overseas is a fantastic way to further your education and boost your career prospect. Australia is known for its diverse and welcoming people. There are so many reasons to consider studying with an Australian education provider. There are certain things which I would like to focus upon. Next slide, please. So one of the key facts which uh, we always talk about, and Kamal did add touch upon that, the Australian education sector compromises of world-leading educational institutions, premium training facilities, and outstanding lecturers and student support services. If you're looking for an unbiased proof that Australian universities truly are world-class, look at the independent global rankings such as Times Higher Education, QS, or Shanghai rankings. Australia has six of the world's top 100 universities. Australian institutions may be relatively young when you're comparing them to universities such as UK's Oxford or US Harvard, but they are up there with the best. The University of Melbourne, Australian National University, University of Sydney, which I am proud to represent, University of Queensland, University of New South Wales, and Macalek Sunila from Monash University all are ranked in top 100 universities in the Times Higher Education World University Rankings. Australia has outstanding higher education system with over 22,000 courses to choose from, around 1,100 institutions. There is a strong emphasis on student experience and graduate outcomes when you study at any university in Australia. International students report almost 90% satisfaction scores for the living and study experience in Australia, according to Department of Education International Student Survey. We already knew that most of the cities in Australia are of a global standard, and they're a great place to live and study, but now it's official. If you look at QS best student cities, almost all major cities, you talk about Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Canberra, Adelaide, Perth, and the Gold Coast are the world's top 100 student cities. Australian cities have the lowest crime rates in the world. Streets and public spaces are open and safe. There are many options for accommodations for students. Students can live in a purpose-built student villages. There are homestay options, private rentals, share houses, and boarding school accommodations as well. So there are plenty of opportunities for students to experience local culture. Over the past 50 years, two and a half million international students have graduated from Australian educational institutions. According to International Education Association of Australia, these graduates are now part of the global alumni network that is making the impact around the world, and you could be one of them. Australia's international education sector drives innovation and collaboration, generating cultural, political, and economic benefits in an increasingly globalized and technologically connected world. Australian universities, colleges, and schools are committed to equipping you with the practical skills and knowledge to help you succeed in your chosen industry. As global demand bones for entrepreneurial and innovative thinkers, Australian education providers have re-engineered their approaches to teaching and learning to inspire thought-leading creativity among students in every discipline. Australian institutions provide an education designed to help you succeed in the global workforce. How do they do that? Australian qualification will make you're very attractive to potential employers in Australia, in your home country and around the world. Most of the degrees and vocational courses include work experience programs, internship, so you can gain hands-on industry experience and grow your professional network while you study. While studying, you can work up to 20 hours per week during the semester, full-time during the semester break. This can be a great way to find study-related work or understand local culture, or simply pay for your lifestyle in Australia. Australia also offers a temporary graduate visa that allows some of international students to stay back in Australia and continue to work after you have graduated from your undergraduate degree. Australia is a very friendly and welcoming country. It's a very multicultural society which respects others no matter who they are or where they come from. Just a fact, do you know almost 30% of Australians are born overseas? 
This has made this country rich with nationalities and cultures from all over the world. When you study in Australia, you will join more than half a million international students from 192 countries who have been welcomed in Australian life. And one of the things when you arrive in Australia, you will notice fresh air and blue skies. It's a long history of protecting beauty and sustainability of environment within Australia. The result, clean and sustainable cities and regional centers with a plenty of green space and relatively low air pollution. Australia is famous for its diverse terrain. The outback is legendary for its broad plains and unusual animals. If you're a beach lover, you are spoiled for choice with thousands of kilometers of pristine coast to choose from. During your holidays, you can dive or snorkel on the gorgeous Great Barrier Reef or go for a bushwalking or kayaking, which is available wherever you stay within a hand store or within a day trip. Australian institutions also plays a great importance on teaching students the value of sustainability and how to apply it to all areas of industry. So if you look at the US sustainability goals or the rankings, most of the Australian institutions are ranked in highly in that area. And how does this help you? There is access to extensive student support services. If you go on the next slide, there is a vast variety of support services for you to succeed. Because we understand students are coming from a different cultural background, different countries. They have a different understanding of a learning system. So when you move to a new country, there is a range of support services available for you that will help you to settle in your new life in Australia. Education provider must comply with a strict quality control and government accreditation measures. So you can be assured you will receive only the best service. In several cities and towns, there are dedicated international student support centers, each offering practical advice and support on issues like legal rights, job skills, and opportunities to meet and socialize with other local as well as international students. Australia has Education Service for Overseas Students Act framework, which enforces by law the best practices protection for the rights of international students studying in Australia, which is fantastic. You're not going to find that in a lot of other places. So you're looking at any kind of a services, club, societies, sports, fitness centers, student association, disability support services, you name it. There's a range of support services for the students available in Australia. If you go on the next slide, we'll be give a bit of an overview about where the institutions are located. When I talked about the long coastal pristine, a lot of beaches to choose from, so you'll see most of the cities in Australia and the institutions are on a coastal area. There are very few institutions which are part in the central part of Australia. So there are a lot of opportunities for you to select institutions based upon your choice and the courses they offer. And you'll be have definitely spoiled for choice when you're selecting. But def as we talked earlier, it will not depend upon where and what you want to study. If you go on the next slide, I know like we wanted to talk a lot about admissions. Kamal did a touch base upon a, some basic art points. Most of the Australian institutions accept A-level results. Majority of Australian institutions will require you to have minimum three subjects at your A-levels. Some of them do consider your AS, but that is a very few, and I will be more than happy to answer those in Q&A. One other point I really want to emphasize here on is English proficiency test. English proficiency test is not only a requirement to enter into the program, but that's also is one of the requirements for your student visa when you apply to study in Australia. So even if your education, your A-level studies have been done in English, it's always a good advice when it comes to applying for Australia, to apply for your student visa. You have one of those ILTS or a PT academics or TOEFL exam to fulfill the English proficiency requirements. I know Kamal did uh, mention about in terms of the subjects. Most of the Australian institutions don't have uh, any specific prerequisite subjects. There are a lot of them are assumed knowledge, but when you talk about engineering, medicine, there are certain prerequisite subjects like math, physics, biology, which you need to meet and which are a requirement, which vary from university to university. So it's always a good idea to check with them. I know like a lot of you will 
been done your subject selections after your O-levels, what you want to do for AS and A2. It's always a good idea to visit university website, check what are the subjects are prerequisite depending upon where you want to move into. Most of the universities would assess you based upon your A-level and English proficiency. But there are certain programs like visual arts or architecture, which might require you to submit an audition or a, submit a portfolio or attend an interview. So be aware of those additional entry requirements depending upon the course you're going to select. There are definitely opportunities for some students to consider pathway option. A lot of times you may or may not meet your direct entry requirements using your A-levels. Certain universities do offer you a foundation or a diploma after which you could get into your first year of bachelor's or a second year of bachelor's. At University of Sydney, we do accept SAT scores. In Australia, SAT is not a requirement, but there are certain institutions where you can submit SAT scores. Like University of Sydney, we would be select using students SAT or A-level, whichever is a higher to enter into the program. So definitely there are such alternative options available. Make sure you ask those questions to the representatives or institutions to understand what are the options you have, how do you can get in into your preferred choice. If you move on to the next slide, please. I wanted to give a bit of a standard study year timeline. Most of the institutions in Australia offer two intakes, one in February, another one in August. So majority of students selects depending upon what program they want to get in. Most of the programs like arts, commerce, engineering, sciences have both the intakes. But if you're going for a specialized programs like music, medicine, or architecture, they might have single intake. So make sure that you check that before applying. And as Kamal mentioned, most of the universities in Australia will accept predicted grades if you were applying for the August intake. And there, each institution has a different process uh, in terms of how those predicted grades are assessed or evaluated. Some of them might need you to have a higher predicted compared to your standard entry requirement. So make sure you do understand that. Normal semesters are run between 12 to 14 weeks. You have a major break in the summer break, which is Australian summer, December to Feb. You get a slightly shorter break for a month, which is a winter month in Australia in July. If you move on to the next slide, please. So application deadlines. This is quite generic. So most of the uh, universities open their applications 12 to 18 months in advance. And applications normally close four to six weeks before the course commencement. So semester one, which is normally in February, so applications close by January. The August intake applications close by June. But there are certain programs which are specific like architecture, medicine, where there are limited quotas. Admission for those ones will have a different timeline. So make sure you check those those normally close two to three months in advance because the number of places are very limited. If you go on the next slide, please. As Kamal mentioned, most of the Austrian institutions have their own standard straight application process. You could upload all your academic transcripts, English proficiency results, your statement of purpose, and admission can be submitted online and admission team will assess uh, your application. If any of your documents are missing, like English proficiency, admission team might issue a conditional offer, or if you're waiting for your final results, then also admission team might issue a conditional offer. Once you have met both the conditions, which are normally academic, which you will fulfill through your A-levels and English proficiency, then admission team will issue your unconditional offer. Once you have received the unconditional offer, then you're in a position to accept and pay the deposit to receive the electronic confirmation of enrollment, which is the document you will use to apply for student visa in Australia. This is the last slide from my side. We'll be more than happy to take any specific questions you have in terms of admission process or any other uh, alternative pathways you want to consider. Now I'll hand over to Sunila. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thank you, Nishan. Thank you very much. This is really very important information, and especially about uh, how you showed us where these universities are located. That was really very attractive feature, especially for those who are considering, you know, and they would like to be closer to the uh, sea, maybe. Uh, but yeah, very thank you so much. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to write those in the question and answer feature, and we'll be taking those towards the end. Uh, moving on. To Sunila. Sunila, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sunila briefly. So, Sunila is a country manager for uh, Pakistan for Monash University. So, she works towards providing student recruitment support to partners and institutions in Pakistan and creating brand awareness for the university. Welcome, Sunila. Thank you for joining. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'll just uh, so I'll just go over a couple of other things. I did notice some questions uh, that have been entered, and I think I'll be going through a couple of them in my slides. So um, sort of uh, have a have a look, and you know, and then if there's any more questions, we'll probably answer it at the end. Uh, can we move forward to the first slide? Okay. So um, I've listed a couple of things that students can uh, sort of consider um, when they're choosing a university. Uh, obviously, um, Nishant has gone over why choose Australia as a destination, but then why, which university should you choose? Um, so one of the biggest reasons why students tend to go to one university over another is the courses of study. We might have a program that another university doesn't or the other way around. Um, the other thing is some courses can be, for example, there's something called um, ACS, which is um, for the IT programs, they're accredited by them. You might want to consider that, hey, I only want to do the you know, ACS accredited program. Or you might want to go to a school that's up for business programs. You might want to go to a school that's triple crown accredited. Um, so that's probably one big reason what is what will help you choose the um, uh, university that you want to go to. Um, the second thing is academic requirements. And uh, there's a lot of different universities, and that's why there's a lot of different academic requirements. We might have a more lenient academic requirement than, say, another university, but in comparison to a different one, we might have a very you know, difficult entry requirement. Then comes in prerequisites, which Nishan did uh, speak about. Some universities require it, others don't. Um, for certain courses. For example, if I have to mention Monash requires math for their business courses. And this is something that students are not really aware. Um, and maybe other universities might not require it. So this is another reason which will help you pick which university which will be best suited for what you have studied. Um, moving forward, location. Uh, this matters, especially because this is where you'll be spending a good three, four years of your life, depending on how long your degree is. And then beyond that, the post-study work visa. So you want to choose the right destination that you feel is uh, good for you and where you'd like to spend those several years of your life. Um, there's metropolitan cities like Sydney and Melbourne, obviously they do have a lot more to offer. Um, but uh, then there is what we call regional areas in uh, Australia as well, uh, which uh, they're, they're obviously a bit urban, um, but or they're a bit rural. But um, the uh, benefit of them is that they can have more opportunities there because of the fact that they might require more employment within one sector um, or they might have more jobs within one sector. So each location sort of has its own benefits and that's where you decide. The other thing within a metropolitan city, for example, I'll mention is location still matters because there's some universities that might be more closer to what we, you know, what we commonly know as downtown. So in Melbourne, we have CBD and there's some universities that are in CBD and then there's some universities a little distant. So this is where cost comes in as well. And it might be the cost of the program, but also the cost of the living that will impact your decision on if you want to go to university that might be in downtown, which will likely increase your cost of living versus a university that's a little distance that in decreases your cost of living, but also the cost of the university um, and the programs that they have to offer. Um, accommodation is another thing. Most universities do have their own accommodation that they do offer to students. 
Um, in a typical sense, yes, accommodation usually do run out quickly. We do, for example, we provide assistance to students for both on-campus and off-campus accommodation. Um, but it can matter to you. On-campus accommodation really is a, a a good experience for students because they're able to get very involved in the activities uh, that they have at the university versus if they're living off campus. But again, it um, kind of links to the cost of uh, uh, your living again. So it depends on um, if you wanna stay on campus, if one university has a suitable accommodation that you're looking for, you're looking for shared space, you're looking for an independent space. Some universities have the independent offering, some universities might not. And then it also links to extracurricular activities, which is when you're living on campus, you're able to get more involved. What kind of facilities does the university offer on campus? What can you get involved in? So, um, and then learning and teaching styles. So each university is a bit different and this is where I uh, incorporate work integrated learning as well. Um, some universities will offer some kind of a work experience, some kind of an on-hands learning within your degree program. This is beneficial to you because once you graduate, you, you are very job ready and, and employees know that, okay, you've graduated, graduated from so-and-so university, you're, you have that learning involved within your degree and you are job ready. So it does make that one degree or one university or so-and-so university stand out. And that's another thing that can help you choose the university that you're um, uh, trying to pick. Um, then length of degree and double degrees. So um, typically uh, there's most degrees can be three years long, honors degrees, engineering, four years long, um, medicine, five years, you know, depending on each university, what it is offering. So that's another thing that can impact your decision. And then there's something called double degrees. Double degrees are two full degrees that you can complete within, within you know, a similar time period. Usually it only adds one, or two years to your degree program because it overlaps, but you're able to graduate with two full degrees from often two separate faculties. So that can be uh, another uh, uh, sort of uh, reason why you might choose one university over another because one university has a bigger range of double degrees over another one. Um, and then there's offshore campuses. Uh, you might want to consider, so this is something that we do see from uh, this region especially, is that students might want to consider spending say one year at one of our offshore campuses and then moving forward to Australia to complete the remainder of their degree. Um, that way they not only get two separate, you know, country experiences and culture experiences, uh, but it also obviously there is a difference in cost as well and they can save up a little bit on that first half that they might be doing at a different uh, campus in the world. So just giving an example, this campus is in Malaysia, a lot of universities in Australia, including Monash, have campuses in Malaysia where they offer the you know, same programs and students can uh, easily transfer the remainder of their degree there. Obviously, we do suggest that students spend at least two years on the Australian campus. And this is eventually when I'll discuss the post-study work visa, this is where it impacts that especially. Um, the last two things, so student life, that matters, same thing, it comes to how involved you can be with um, uh, your experience at the university and what the university has to offer beyond the education. Uh, and then the last thing I've mentioned here is ranking. So uh, rankings do matter, especially when it comes to getting employment. So for example, Monash, University of Sydney, these are group of eight universities. And most of these group of eight universities are ranked in the top 100 in the world and in the top eight in Australia. Um, and this makes them stand out because of the quality of education that we provide and the learning and teaching styles that these universities have, because this is where employers realize that these universities have those job ready students, which makes um, them come and prefer picking their graduates from group of eight or higher ranked universities. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, some popular programs that we get, especially from this region, engineering, IT, business, this is, you know, these three are the most popular programs that students tend to pick. Um, now, coming back to how you pick your university, some universities might have the specialization that you're interested in and others might not. Engineering, you know, we have, you know, a, a number of specializations within the engineering field. You might want to study aerospace, you might want to study mechatronics, all of that is there, IT, 
Uh, same thing. So there's in Australia popular programs and in demand programs, and you know, uh, growth is seen within the sector IT. Uh, so there's cybersecurity, data science, and you know, it has predicted growth within the sector over the next several years. Um, and we encourage students, in fact, even to go for specialized programs if they're choosing between, you know, or they're trying to figure out what they want to do. Uh, business is one of the most popular sort of fields. Um, there is comprehensive degrees, which is something you would consider something like a uh, Bachelor of Business, for example. And this is where you do a three year program where your first year is a foundation sort of program where you get the opportunity to study uh, various fields of the uh, 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 of business and then eventually uh, you can specialize. But then some students know from the beginning, hey, I want to study accounting or I want to study, uh, you know, uh, any of the other programs like finance. Uh, or banking and finance. So um, these are specialized degrees and this is also what a lot of universities offer and it all depends on what you're interested in. Um, arts and social sciences, there's a lot of different fields. If you, you know, psychology, sociology, all of these sit there. Um, and I'll touch a little on medicine because this is a very popular course in, in the Pakistani market, especially. So Monash is, or Australia is, has one of the best, uh, so some of the best medicine programs in the world. And yes, we encourage students if they have the grades to get in, but medicine does have a bit of a higher requirement as compared to other uh, programs and limited seats. Uh, the first thing, the most important thing is obviously you have to have the grades, then dependent on each university, you might have to take an external medicine program that each university sort of requires. Monash requires something called the ISAD. And uh, then, you know, you submit your application, you go through the process. Um, just to give you an idea, medicine, at least for Monash, it's, it costs about a 90,000 plus per year, and it is a direct entry program. It does not require you to go um, study in, uh, an undergrad first, but we have that postgraduate option as well. But that's the cost of the program. Keep in mind that obviously it's expensive, but if you have and if you can and if you're very keen, you should definitely go and apply for it because, like I said, it's one of the best programs in the world and Australia has some of the universities with best uh, medicine programs. But keep in mind that beyond medicine, there's other health sciences fields. Nursing is a very fantastic program that students can consider to stay within that health sciences field. Psychology is another program. We encourage students, if not medicine, to have a plan B, to have that plan B so that they can still stay within the sort of field that they're interested in, in case that medicine is not something they can uh, move forward with. Uh, can I get the next slide? Uh, scholarships. So a very, very popular question. There's various scholarships all across Australian universities. Um, and there's different uh, sort of criteria for each one. Some can be merit most actually often they're merit based, meaning you have to have a minimum sort of grade requirement in order to be a, uh, applying for these scholarships. Some universities offer region based scholarships. This means that, uh, you know, they might be very specific to South Asia, or they might be very specific to say Pakistan. Um, and they will, again, minimum requirement comes in, but you will likely get it because you're, you know, in this region and so on and so on. The scholarship process typically uh, involves, a, and this is for a lot of universities that might not be when I say region based, it can involve, say, submitting an essay beyond your offer letter. Um, and then if your essay gets shortlisted, you might get interviews. There are up to 100% tuition fee scholarships available, including at Monash. But keep in mind, they're limited. The process of the scholarships are, you know, you go through the essay, you go to the interview, and they're looking for the best possible candidates. But keeping in mind that uh, grades is just a minimum requirement to be eligible to apply for these scholarships. Um, I'd like to mention one other thing that uh, we have that some other universities might have as well is study grants. So study grants are like uh, discounts. You can get these study grants off in the first year of um, uh, tuition, but beyond that is full fee. Keep in mind that these are not scholarships and they might be just region based. It comes back to the same thing, but if you are eligible for it or if you're within this region and it's something that a university can offer, then they can, you know, that gives you a good incentive to pursue your offer at any given university in Australia. Um, next slide. 
so part-time jobs while studying, yes, students are able to work while they're studying currently. Uh, so pre-COVID, it was 40 hours bi-weekly that students were allowed, but currently it is full-time. Keep in mind that they might change it back to, you know, 40 hours. So I still like to highlight that, um, you know, so that's basically like 20 hours per week. And then during uh, semester breaks, you can work full time. The current minimum wage is $20.33. What we just like to mention is, um, uh, because this is something I face a lot in this region is, keep in mind, you might be able to work part time and cover your living expenses like rent or pitch in towards them and uh, you know rent and food and travel and extra things. But your tuition fee should always be paid from back home and you should always have that you know plan in mind that it needs to be covered from back home. You cannot live there and work and uh, cover your tuition fee because either you go, you know, you don't have the time to study then. And if you're going to such universities and your studies are so in uh, intensive, you cannot uh, focus on both things. And, and, and the other thing is obviously there is that limitation that as a student, uh, typically students are allowed to work only 40 hours per week. So uh, just to, I, I just like to highlight that because it's something that I get asked in this region. Um, next slide. Uh, the post-study work visa. So uh, this is something that, this is why Australia might be a very popular destination is because they offer the post-study work visa. The undergraduate students are able to get uh, two, uh, minimum two years of post-study work visa. It can be uh, a year or two years more in other regions within Australia. Uh, but uh, in regions like Melbourne and Sydney, right now you're able to get a two-year post-study work visa, the opportunity to work uh, in Australia after you graduate uh, from your degree. Uh, obviously, the re minimum requirement is that you need to study at least two years in Australia in order to be eligible for these. So when I mentioned the uh, off campus or offshore campuses, you study one year there. If you're in a three year degree and you spend two years in Australia to be eligible for this study, uh, post study work visa. Uh, currently, uh, graduate students are able to get a three year post study work visa. So say hypothetically, you go and you do your bachelor's and you decide to do your master's right after uh, you would be eligible to go for a three year post-study work visa minimum and that is basically within this um, Melbourne, Sydney and so on regions but other regions might have even a longer uh, post-study work visa opportunity for you guys. Um, next slide. Uh, job opportunities. So um, obviously each degree, each sort of specialization has its own job opportunity. What I can mention here is the kind of services that various universities provide to students to be able to excel in their careers. So there is a lot of career coaching uh, for students. Students are given you know, the opportunities to attend workshops where they can uh, develop their interview skills, they can tailor their resumes and you know be taught those things. Uh, so we have such, um, uh, uh, we have a career department, for example, and this is services that we provide within our career department. And uh, we help you develop the necessary skills that you might need that will help you sort of land whatever job you're looking for once you graduate within your relevant field. And um, the one thing that uh, uh, a lot of universities might have is that industry-based learning, which I mentioned before, which is built in within your degree, uh, the opportunities to sort of work with it while you're studying as part of your program so that you can develop the necessary job skills that are required so that you, know, you stand out when you are being hired. After you complete your degree, you have obviously the opportunity to work. Uh, and pursue, you know, uh, employment within your field and uh, employers to come and they select graduates from, you know, various universities. We have employment, you know, career workshops and career fairs and so and so. And the one other opportunity option that students have is research degrees. So you might want to complete your degree and use it as a pathway to enter a research program. So, for example, a master's by research. And that is the other option that students can pick. Um, this is my last slide, I believe. Um, if there's, you know, any questions or anything, please um, uh, enter them into the Q&A and thank you so much for everyone's time.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Nella. You covered a lot of points that are being asked in the questions. So I guess this is, this is I, I'm sure a lot of questions must have already been answered. And uh, like, you know, thank you again for that. Uh, I'd like to let you know that Sunila is based in Pakistan. So, you know, she understands the concerns you face and the questions that students ask you quite often. So if you have any specific question still that you'd like to ask Sunila, please do write that down in the question and answer function and we'll take that. So I think we'll just move on to the questions then and see what we have. Um, so, okay, so the first question we ask, uh, we have is, are there any scholarship programs for the Australian universities? And secondly, do Australian universities support aeronautical engineering programs? So Sunila, you've already answered the scholarship portion of what scholarship opportunities are available. So if you, you could just briefly sum that in like one line, and then you could, uh, if you could answer the part where uh, they ask if Australian universities support aeronautical engineering programs. Um, yeah, so scholarships, as I mentioned, uh, various universities have different scholarship opportunities. Uh, make sure you obviously do your research towards each university because every university does have their own criteria on how they offer scholarships. Um, when it comes to the second part of the question, um, yes, aeronautical engineering. So again, same thing, different universities have different offerings. We at Monash have aerospace engineering that students find very similar to the same field and they tend to go towards that. Yes, that um, specialization is available. Thanks, Anila. Uh, I think the next one would also be for you. Uh, they, they say a lot of our students are interested in studying medicine from Australia. So what is the admission procedure and the length of the course? So I know you've touched upon this, but can you just highlight how long the course is and what exactly is the procedure? Sure. So I, I specify this uh, towards Monash specifically. Basically, a student requires at least three A's, which is, you know, the maximum sort of thing. That's the minimum requirement to be eligible to apply. Then they sit an exam, uh, a medicine entry exam. And keeping in mind that I believe it does, it is not offered here. So students have to travel to sit that exam. It's called the ISAD. And after that, they submit an application towards, if they meet the requirement, they submit an application towards the medicine program. Um, and if selected, they go through interviews and so and so. Um, keeping in mind, obviously, these are quota courses, which means that they're only selecting, and this is probably common to all universities, they're only selecting a small number of international students. It might not be even specific to Pakistan. And so it's very, very competitive. The cost of the program, I'll say this in rupees, uh, and this is just an estimate, probably like around one crore rupees per year. And typically for us, we have a direct entry program. It's a five year long program. So you're looking at that much money for five years each year. And we do have a, a graduate entry program, which is a four year long program. Um, and the cost of the program is similar as well, but same thing, you have to have the undergrad, uh, preferably uh, biomedic, uh, biomedical science. And that's another opportunity for students to consider medicine. Thank you, Sunila. That was very uh, informative. And I'd like to highlight what Sunila said earlier, that there are other alternative uh, medicine related degrees available, for example, nursing and you know other health sciences of degrees available. So if your students like, you can also research into those and see if you know they would prefer those degrees instead of doing an MBBS. Okay, so the next question we have is, uh, please confirm the estimated study cost of different fields like medicine, business, engineering, art, etc. Alongside this, the undergraduate courses are of three years or four years. So I know you've already um, touched upon medicine, but if you give like a like a cost idea of other degrees, for example, business and engineering, and whether they are three years degrees or four year degrees. Um, yeah, so uh, at Monash, we have three year business degrees mostly. And then uh, some degrees can be four years long, for example, psychology, um, engineering, these are four year long degrees. Um, so it sort of depends on, you know, which program you're going into. Monash, uh, again, again, the universities are different across Australia. Monash cost is about, I would estimate 45 to 48,000 Australian dollars for typical programs like engineering, IT and business. Um, again, uh, uh, social sciences and uh, they're a bit, towards the 38 to 39,000 Australian dollars. And these are per year cost. And by the way, these are in Australian dollars. Thanks, yeah, no, that, that's, that's an important point, point to highlight. Great, thank you, Sunila. Uh, I think the next question I would be for you, Nishant. It, uh, we have Shaheen who says, are SAT, UCAT sort of tests required towards Australia as well, or are they not required? Okay. SAT is not a compulsory. So, but there are institutions like uh, I'm talking about Sydney, we do accept SAT as an alternative, 
Like just to give you an example, someone who wants to do a Bachelor of Commerce with the University of Sydney needs one A stars and two A. That's a minimum entry requirement. But a lot of times students may or may not meet that requirement and they use alternatives like a SAT 1370 can get you uh, direct entry into the program. So there are SAT used as an alternative. UCAT, like uh, Sunila mentioned, could be a use when you're applying for an MBBS degrees because in Australia you could have a MBBS or a US pathway where you have a Bachelor of Science followed by a Doctor of Medicine. So if you go to University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, UNSW, you'd be looking at doing a Bachelor of Science followed by a Doctor of Medicine. That's a different pathway. A standard MBBS pathway is very limited options in uh, Australia, but when you go for a different pathway, then UCAT can uh, come into picture. Thank you, thank you, Nishant. Um, I believe the next question would be for you, um, Kamal. So um, it says, how effectively are IGCSC results for foreign universities accepted in comparison to O-levels, considering the equivalency criteria? So um, I believe they're trying to say, they're, they're trying to ask how, how effective are IGCSCs compared to O-levels in getting admissions. Right, uh, thanks, Sonia. I think effectively, I would say that they are equivalent. For universities that recognize IGCSE, they would also recognize O levels. And that would definitely be the case of Australian universities as well, especially for English language requirements. I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sunila or Nishan, but if you uh, you know, if you do first language uh, English, uh, IGCSE would be equivalent for O levels as well. And in terms of O levels, um, there are countries such as Singapore that do O levels as well. So, you know, in terms of familiarity, universities are very familiar with O levels and many of them actually, you know, put it as equal as IGCSE, yeah. So there's, there's really no uh, concern about the uh, equivalency of IGCSE and O levels, yeah. So even if you're talking about O levels, it's very, very, uh, it's, it's a qualification that's very familiar to universities as well. Right, thank you, Kamal, thank you. Um, so then this, this next question, I believe Sunilla, you or Nishant can answer. So they, the question being asked is, what are the conditions of progression from the offshore campuses to Australian campus, especially students doing pathways from all offshore campuses? Um, so I'll, uh, I'll take the question. Uh, basically, uh, students obviously have to meet the minimum WAM in order to progress. They have to obviously perform in their first year of uh, degree or say they're doing the pathway foundation diplomas. They have to meet that requirement in order to progress. That's pretty much it. Uh, it is a very seamless transfer, uh, but the entry requirement is sort of they have to make sure that they're performing in their uh, program at the offshore campus. Okay, thank you. No, I think this is something that will be very useful because a lot of students do ask how they can transfer from offshore campuses to Australia. So thank you and for that. Also, yes. just a quickly yeah. adding there because all the universities would accept, like uh, let's say just give an example of how Monash has a Malaysia campus. If someone is doing studies there and trying to apply for a different institution, those are recognized. So that's also for students to be aware of you're not locked into a one particular university per se. If they're looking for options or opportunities, they do have those options. Oh, wonderful. So you're saying university transfers are also possible. Thank you very much. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. So we, we actually answered all the questions we had in the question answer function, but because we have like a few minutes, I'd also take these two questions we have in the chat. And I believe Sunila, you might be able to answer because you're in Pakistan. So I guess you would know that um, they, the, uh, we have a question that says previously there were visa restrictions on students from Balochistan and KP. Is that something still which is still happening or has that changed? Um... So this is a, a, a difficult question for me to answer because this is something, so we call this GTE, genuine temporary entrant. And um, your location, place of birth, it impacts your application for sure. Uh, a lot of the times when it comes to these two regions, um, what we have to do is if the student's background is good, if the student has relevant finances, sort of what the parents do, um, that's when we look at the overall application. So it's not always a straight up no. It's, it's we have to look at a lot of different factors. And the, the main goal is that we don't want your visa rejection for, you know, obviously it impacts us and it impacts the student because once you get an Australia visa rejection, 
it will impact you for your visas across the world. So um, yes, these regions, we are a bit more careful towards than, you know, the typical Islamabad, Lahore and Karachi. Uh, but if you can, you know, sort of have a good application and strong educational background, um, you know, that kind of a thing. So then we can have a look at uh, uh, these applications. Now, I I'd just like to mention, and this is not um, related to this question is, at Monash, I, I don't know if Sydney does, but at Monash, we do take applications directly and we take them through Common App um, as well. Um, and so what we do is when a student's application comes in, we do a little check from our end as well to make sure that the student meets not just the entry requirement, but the GT requirement that is, you know, region based or their education finances, so and so. Hopefully, okay, thank you. Nishan, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, so like a genuine temporary entrant criteria is for your student visa application, which looks at your political, financial, educational background. And what they're assessing is like, after you have spent so much of money and when you go back to your home country, is that you are you getting a best return on investment? Do you have any alternatives within the region? Do you have means to support yourself? And you're not using student visa as a pathway to move somewhere else. So those are the questions which will be asked by the immigration officer. And that's what most of the universities will check when you submit a GT document, a genuine temporary uh, requirement document. And that's where it's not highlighting one specific region. It could happen to anyone coming from Islamabad or Karachi as well. But knowing uh, the political scenarios or attentions, the certain uh, regions get some more highlighted. Yeah, thank you for adding Nisha. So it's no hard and fast rule. It's actually just very dependent from case to case. And how best you present you get present your case, the more, you know, the better chances there are to get your visa. So I I yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And just a, just a last question to close it off. I know we've read it on over time, two minutes. Um, uh, if, can I, the, the question is, can you please describe a bit about uh, some details on the research courses? So Sunila, you touched upon the research degree. So they just want to uh, trying to get some information on those courses. Um, so research courses, I'll just say that uh, when you're applying from Pakistan, for example, directly towards a research course, um, that's a bit, um, the pathway or the admission process to that is different. It requires you to find a supervisor, submit a proposal, you know, so and so. Um, the research courses that I was mentioning were how your degree can be a pathway into one of, you know, say, for example, Monash research courses. And they create that seamless process because often research or thesis is involved in or is an option for students to pick in their program. And that's sort of what they can move forward with. But applying directly to a research program is a completely different process and it doesn't necessarily go through student recruitment. It, it requires faculty approval. I, I think Nishant, you might want to add to that. Yeah, I said research is quite different. Again, a research you're looking at a master's level or doing research as an honors here after your bachelor's. So you definitely have that as a good opportunity in Australia, where you do three year bachelor's and add your fourth year as a research year, which could be an honors year, whether it's an arts, sciences, or a commerce, or your standard engineering has a final year as a research year. So that's quite unique to Australia. If you have done that research year, then you could bypass your master's and get into PhD directly. So that's a good alternative for students who are looking at a research careers in future. Thank you. Thank you both Sunila and Nishant. And if you have more questions on this, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll get those answers for you and I'll get back to you uh, with more information. Uh, because we're you know, short on time and I, we can't take you know, more questions and we can go into uh, you know, more detail. But I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you for attending uh, this webinar. Thank you for being, uh, you know, uh, being answer, asking questions and you know, uh, participating. I'm going to leave the link of the feedback form in the chat um, and you know, uh, please Feel free to give your feedback, give suggestions on what you'd like to hear in the future. Meanwhile, uh, you know, I'd like to give a chance to our panelists to just say a concluding thought. So, you know, um, just to, uh, one small thing you'd like to say towards the end. So, you know, starting with Kamal. Thanks, Sanya. I just want to probably highlight the fact that scholarships are very competitive, as mentioned by our presenters just now. And uh, it's not, you know, with regard to university based scholarships, you're talking about applicants from different parts of the world. So, just you know, take note of the competitiveness of scholarships available for you. 
Yeah, indeed, a very important point. Thank you, Kamal. So over Nishant, a concluding thought uh, from you. Yeah, thanks for everyone joining in. One of the things which I always try to tell students is don't make your decision based on convenience. Don't default to what is easiest now. Take your time to make decision based upon what is the best for path for you over long term. It's a long term commitment, whatever you're doing when you're studying any undergraduate degree, wherever you go. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a tip which we can generally use over, you know, our life. It's a general principle we can use. Thank you. Uh, Sunila, would you like to say something? Uh, no, that's uh, it's very true what he was saying. And, and uh, it's something that we suggest to students as well, especially when they come in and they'll ask, hey, what should I study or so and so. I do encourage students to go towards more specialized programs to, uh, you know, uh, because they are something that um, Australia is known for and so on and so on. And I will say the same thing to students here. Um, take a variety of, if, you know, if they're starting A-levels, take a good number of A-level uh, courses that are different so you can keep your options open. Um, but, you know, I, I know that this is uh, something I said earlier, take maths, because I, you know, I see a lot of students, you know, saying, and math can open your opportunities, not just to business, but a lot of the courses say IT and everything. Um, so, and they can change their minds later. And, you know, so uh, we encourage that. And uh, that's pretty much it. I didn't have my email there. So I did enter it into the um, chat box in case anyone has any further questions for me as well. Thank you, Sunilla. Thank you. Yes, the email is in the chat box. So if you have any questions, I see there are a couple of other questions coming in the chat. I'm sorry because of the time limitation, we're unable to take that online. But please drop us an email either to me directly or to Sunilla or to Nishant or Kamal if you think, uh, you know, whoever can best answer your question and we'd be happy to get back to you. Uh, so yeah, just concluding this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending this. And thank you, the panelists, very much for, you know, taking our time and being part of this webinar. Um, Nishant from joining from Australia and we have Kamal joining from you know europe thank you um you know despite being on a holiday you were able to join us and give us time to uh, you know talk about these admissions and very important points that we discuss with our schools so thank you so much everybody i hope you'd be able to uh, you know leave some feedback in the feedback form and um, i hope to see you in the next webinar um, next month so stay tuned and thank you goodbye thank you bye-bye awesome.